here's the joke of the day. This was given to me by one of our members. One of those snobbish people from the church asked the pastor to come and have a cup of tea and some biscuits with her. And so she brought out very expensive china, very expensive cups, and her most prized possessions, her, her, her silver spoons. She brought him sugar and he stirred it. They had a nice conversation. She began to explain to him how she's having so much problems in life. He told her, he said, sister, the answer is in the word of God. You need to get in the word. You need to read it and study it and, and live it. She smiled and said, oh, I read the Bible every day. You see my, my Bible right there on the coffee table right next to you? I read it every single day. That's not my problem. Well, the pastor tried to encourage her. Well, stay in the word of God. Keep reading it. She promised to do so. He got up, left. As she was cleaning up, she noticed that the silver spoon that she gave the pastor was missing. She couldn't believe that the pastor would steal such a valuable uh, item. She began to search all over, couldn't find it. For months, this bothered her. She would go to church but have a sour look because after all, she knew that pastor had stole the silver spoon. Months went by. She could take it no longer. She had to confront him. So six months later, she invited him to the house again for a cup of tea. He sat down. She looked at him and said, Pastor, I've been having a problem with you. I must admit, I have unforgiveness. He said, what is it, sister? He said, last time I gave you a silver spoon, did you take it? He looked and said, no, sister, I didn't take it, but I did put it in your Bible. <laughs> y'all brought your Bibles, lift them up real high, make this, make this as your declaration. Say, this is my Bible. It is the Word of God. I am who it says I am. I can do what it says I can do. And I have what it says I have. I boldly declare that my mind is alert, my heart is receptive, and my cell phone is off. I will never be the same. In Jesus' name, Turn to someone right next to you. Look him straight in the eye and say, did you hear that, Charlie God? I will never, ever, ever be the same again. God bless you. You all may be seated. If you would, open up your Bibles to James chapter 1. And now, Father, as I begin this series of messages, I pray, Lord, that you would anoint me to be able to do just that. That all the hunters that are here, that they would truly be anointed. And those listening by CDs, watching by television and online, that their hearts would be truly touched as they comprehend your nature as a giver. And I want to thank you in advance for this. In Jesus' name, amen. James chapter 1, I want us to begin with the fifth verse. If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt. Because the one who doubts is like the wave of a sea blown here and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Such a person is double-minded and unstable in all they do. You know, I've been ministering the gospel for over 33 years. I preach, of course, the full gospel message of salvation and healing and deliverance. But I have noticed in my travels and here in the church that many of God's sincere saints are having difficulty receiving the promised blessings from God. I know some are struggling with receiving the assurance of salvation. Even though they've accepted the Lord and been baptized, they still have these fears that they're not forgiven. They committed the unpardonable sin, and yet God has given them the promise of the assurance of salvation. And others struggle with receiving the baptism of the Spirit. They have been prayed for by many people, but still, they've never been released in the wonderful gift of tongues. And still others are tormented by evil spirits, and although many exorcists have tried to pray for them, they still have failed to receive the promised deliverance that Christ has offered. 
And then others, they need wisdom. But instead of getting wisdom, they keep making the same foolish mistakes over and over and over again. And still others, though God has promised to give you dominion and victory over sin, they're still struggling with sinful habits, alcohol, drugs, pornography, gambling, anger. These addictions keep them down, though God has promised them freedom. Listen, I have a word from God for you. I believe it's not an accident that you're here in this service. God has an answer for you. He wants you to receive everything that he's promised. And I want to talk to you about just that. James says, a man who doubts should not think he will receive anything. So he, he doesn't just mention wisdom, though that is the primary gift. He says anything including health and healing. You say, but I've been prayed for. I'm still sick. Nothing's changing. I'm still struggling with toxic soul ties. I, I still i am haunted by my past memories. I haven't been able to, to, to overcome. But you can overcome. That's the point. And God says, a person who doubts should not think he will receive anything. Health, healing, the spirit, whatever it is that you need from God, you're not going to receive anything from God if you doubt. So what is James saying here? Now James was the brother of our Lord Jesus Christ. At first he was a doubter, so I think that's why he emphasized so much about faith, because he knows what doubt robbed him of. So he doubted his, his older brother's mission, but then when Jesus rose from the dead, all of his brothers, including James, became believers. Well, because of his close relationship uh, with Jesus, uh, he became the leading uh, apostle in the church of Jerusalem. So he, in particular, knows something, the heart of Jesus, in a way that none of us probably could not know because we didn't walk with Jesus. We didn't write, uh, get, grow up with him, but he did. And what is the message he begins this epistle with? What is the thing he is stressing above all things he's beginning something and he's talking about receiving from god he's talking about getting every anything you need from god. ask and it's going to be given to you he's he's emphasizing the importance of how to receive from god so i want to talk to you today and next sunday about how to receive from god basically as i look at what james had to say there's two things I think he is emphasizing. Number one, it is God's nature to give. The first thing he wants you to know, ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault. What is he saying? It is the very nature of God to give. He's a giver. Now, you might be thinking at this point, uh, but, you know, um, J uh, didn't Job say that the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away? It's true. He said that. But when Job said that, he's not making a theological statement. He's making a practical statement about his devotion to God. And he's saying, in essence, if I lose my health and lose my wealth and lose my wife's respect and lose my children, I'm still going to serve God no matter what because who else am I going to turn to? He has everything. So he's, his statement is not meant to be theologically truthful statement. And, and, and that's the problem when, when people read the Bible. They'll read something, and they'll try to make every statement a theological truth instead of recognizing there are theological truths found in Scriptures, but there's also practical truths. There's also commitments that are made. There are s things that are said that you have to take in light of the rest of the Bible as well and just don't take that particular verse. Well, it's true. Job says, the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away, but... That's not theologically true. God is a giver. And here's the thing. If you start to think God is the one taking, how will you ever be receiving? Do you see this? If you're struggling with illness and you're praying to God to heal you, but if you think he made you sick, how could you have faith to receive his healing? Because you already think he's taking 
if you think he's taking your job and taking your wealth and taking your money, how can you pray for wealth if you think he's taking? And so James lays out the foundation that it is God's nature to give. In fact, he emphasizes that later in James 1 verse 17, every gift is from above coming down from the Father of heavenly lights. What is he saying? Every gift. It's coming from the Father. He is essentially a giver. So that's the first truth that James is laying out. God's nature is to give. But the second truth he lays out, it is the responsibility of people to receive. Now, this is the other part. It's God's nature to give, but it is also your responsibility to receive what God gives. So just because God gives doesn't necessarily mean you automatically receive. No, you have a responsibility, a part to play in receiving what God gives. So you have to keep those two thoughts in mind, and this is what James essentially is saying. It's God's nature to give, but it is your responsibility to receive what God is giving. So the issue is not getting God to give, but getting you in a position to receive. A quarterback throws a pass. I knew I'd bring the Super Bowl in. But, you know, a quarterback can throw a perfect spiral right into the arms of an open wide receiver. And how many times has that receiver dropped the ball? Any Redskin fans can understand that. Like, what in the world is wrong with our... They drop it. The pass is thrown, but... They're called a receiver for a reason. They're supposed to receive what the quarterback gives. And some of you, spiritually speaking, have fumbling hands. God's giving, but you're not receiving. You're not receiving the health. You're not receiving the wealth. You're not receiving the baptism of the Spirit. You're not receiving wisdom. You're not receiving deliverance. You're fumbling. There's a part that you have to play in receiving. What comes first, giving or receiving? Yeah, giving has to precede receiving. How can you receive if you haven't been given? As John the Baptist said, a man can only uh, receive what is given to him from heaven. So even John knew, this ministry I have, I, I did not make this ministry up, God gave it to me, and I can only receive what, the, what God has given to me. So God has to give first before you can receive. So if that's the case, and it is the case, we all know you have to have first God give, I think one of our difficulties in receiving is we don't really understand how God gives. We're a little confused about that. So I want to take this next few minutes to explain to you about God's nature to give. James mentions this in verse 5. Let's look at this. If anyone of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God who, what does God do? Who, what? Gives. The first thing I want you to see is God gives. Now, in the Greek, And the New Testament was originally written in Greek. The Greek has different verb tenses, unlike in the English. In the English, we have only three verb tense, past, present, and future. All right? And because of it, we have a hard time even appreciating communion because we look at Christ in the past gave his life, but we, we don't understand his crucifixion is not just the past, It's not just the present, and it's not just the future. It is present continuum. And in the Greek, the word give, your King James Bible has giveth. Usually the the King James puts the TH when there's another verb. And this is called a prolonged form of the primary verb. And what that means is when James says the Lord giveth, it doesn't mean he's giving at that moment or he's about to give, 
Rather, he has continually be, has been giving. In other words, you asking God for something did not make God at that moment give because he was giving even before you asked. Or as Isaiah says, God says, before you called, I answered you. Well, how in the world can God answer before I called? Because he always has the answer because he's always giving before you can pray. So before you ask God, heal me, he was already giving healing. Before you ask for wisdom, he was already giving wisdom. Even Solomon saw this. Solomon writes, speaking of the wisdom of God, he says God's wisdom has been here from the foundation of the world. And wisdom has been crying out in the streets. Hear me, hear me. Any, any simple person, any foolish person, want wisdom, listen to him. He's saying he's crying out. He's been here from the very beginning, still crying out. So the picture is, God is continually giving. Your prayer did not start God giving. He was giving before you asked. So you asked for healing. God was already healing you. I don't understand. Uh, go over to Acts 9. Keep your finger, by the way, in James. Go over to Acts 9. Let, let me show you something about a healing of a man named Aeneas. And something that Peter says to him, there's one of the servants who's sick and they call for Peter to pray for him and ask God to heal him. And listen to what Peter says to Aeneas. This is uh, Acts chapter 9. Let's begin with verse 33. It says, there uh, he found a man named Aeneas who was paralyzed and had been bedridden for eight years. Aeneas, Peter said to him, Jesus Christ, what does he say? Jesus Christ heals you. Get up. Roll up your mat. Why? Jesus Christ heals you. Now, I want you to notice Peter doesn't say, Aeneas, I'm here now. Are you ready? The Lord's about to heal you. He's about to do something. Do you feel it? I feel the presence of God coming. He's about to come. He's real close to you, Aeneas. He's about to touch you. You're about to be healed. God, yes, yes, I feel it. Yes, he's about to. I think, here, here it is. Right now, Jesus just touched you. No, no, no. Peter doesn't say, Jesus Christ will heal you because if he says Jesus Christ will that means for eight years he hasn't some of you think because you haven't got healed you haven't got delivered you haven't broken that toxic soul tie you think because you haven't broken those addictive habits you're thinking God hasn't given the freedom to you yet wrong He's already been giving it to you. You just haven't received it. This is a powerful, profound revelation. Because some of you are thinking, when is, uh, and who's ever said this, when is God going to save my husband? When is he going to heal my body? When is he going to give me my wisdom? When is he going to give me a job? When is God going to meet my needs? When is he going to help me? When is God? And so you're thinking when, because you're thinking since you don't have it yet, he hasn't done it yet. But here's the truth. Peter says to Aeneas, Aeneas, Jesus Christ heals you. That is in the present participle. He is healing he has in other words Aeneas for 18 for eight years while you've been paralyzed Jesus Christ has been healing you. eight years I, I thought he, he he left me I thought he's waiting for some no he's been healing you for eight years see prayer is not getting God to do anything you really think you have the power to make God give? He already has been giving. You sure didn't make him give. Jesus Christ, he, this is a powerful statement because Peter sees it's already been done for you, Aeneas. Now, what's the job of the minister then? The minister is to connect him 
to what God's already been doing. You all have cell phones, don't you? Your cell phone's off? Some of you, you know, I see you texting. He's still preaching. Where do you want to go out to eat? Like, 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 like. And here I have the words of eternal life and you're playing with your phone, right? But your phone is off. Does that mean that the data of Verizon, Sprint, or whoever is your provider, does that mean the data is not working? Does that mean the wireless that we have at the church is, is off? No, it's the wireless is, it, in other words, in this room, there's literally, there's not one space in this sanctuary that doesn't have the data beaming its waves. The data is all here. It's permeating it. But with your cell phone off, you don't notice it. But it's always been here. So after the service is over, what, what will you do? You'll turn on your cell phone and bing, 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 oh, guess who wrote to me? Truth of the matter is that person probably wrote to you an hour ago. But you only bing, got it now when you turned on the phone. But the message was sent an hour ago, an hour and a half ago, and only now do you get it. You don't, see, you know in the natural, they didn't just send it. You just got it. Are you getting this? When you get healed or when God gives you a job or you finally speak in tongues or the power of God comes on you and the healing finally is manifested, that's not when God sent you the miracle. He was already beaming the miracle and his gifts every day, all the time. And all the minister is trying to do is connect you. And what Peter is saying and Nias, it's time to turn on your cell phone. Ding! Boom! Oh, God just healed me. No, he didn't just heal you. He's, Jesus Christ heals you. Now get up! Okay. If, he, if he's been healing you for eight years, why have you been laying down for eight years? So, the first truth of God's nature to give is God gives continually. That's the principle. Is God gives continually. He's always giving. Not a time that he started giving. He was giving long before you even asked. In the time of my favor, God says, now is the day of salvation. When, is, when can you get saved? Now. Some of you, though, won't get saved till a year from now. Why? Your own fault. You, you could have got saved now. Now's the day of salvation. God is in the now because he's already been giving everything you need for life and godliness. It's all there. But you just haven't turned on the switch of faith. You haven't connected to the wires. It's, it's like your house. You can have your house all wired, but if you don't connect it to the, to the electric company or to a generator, all the wires are useless. You can turn on the switch, nothing will come on because you're not connected. It's not the electric company's fault. You did not connect. Here it is. God has everything. Deliverance of sin, deliverance from demons, healing of the body, breaking of toxic souls, healing of memories, healing of a broken heart. You are watching The Bondage Breaker with Bishop Tom Brown. To receive today's message in its entirety, call us now at 915-855-WORD. That's 915-855-9673. If you prefer to request the message by mail, then follow the information on the screen and don't forget to specify today's title. Bishop Brown's ministry of spiritual deliverance is well known in America and around the world. His message of freedom and victory in Christ is found in his best-selling books. Come by Word of Life Church for an autographed copy. Word of Life Church has a first-class children's ministry with small classrooms so children have more individual attention. Children also get to enjoy one of the largest indoor playgrounds in the city. Many parents are concerned for their teenagers. Be at ease. 
Here at Word of Life Church, your teenagers will feel like they are a part of a group of youth that are truly committed to Christ. You won't find better music anywhere in El Paso than by our church band. Our talented musicians and singers will lift your spirits up to God as they play the latest music while incorporating the great classical hymns. Fellowship is important to us, so we have provided a relaxing atmosphere in our expanded coffee shop. Enjoy a latte or fresh pastry while you make new friends. Word of Life Church believes in helping those in need. Word of Life quietly helps provide food, clothing, and aid to the needy. Visit us at Word of Life Church and make a positive difference, not only in your own life, but the lives of others. Word of Life Church meets every Sunday at 9 and 11 a.m. and 1.30 p.m. for Spanish. Bible study is on Tuesday at 7.15 p.m. The church meets at 11675 Pratt Avenue. That's near the intersection of Pebble Hills and Saul Kleinfeld across from Walmart. For more information about this spirit-filled church, call 855-9673. That's 855-WORD. 